the NBA playoffs are rolling right along. Pete Carroll says, can we all just get along? Des Bryant isn't budging. Will the Lakers really make big changes? J.J. Watt steps up big time. And the Kardashians rule in our off-topic segment. All that and more on What's the 401 Sports, coming right up. Welcome to this week's edition of What's the 401 Sports. I'm Keisha Wilson. And I'm Mike McDonald. I have to ask you all to bear with me. I am fighting cooties. My voice is a little hoarse. It's going in and out. So I apologize, but I'm going to do my best so you can hear all the great stuff that we have to say. But enough about my woes. We're going to talk about the NBA Finals. They are here. They are in full effect. And there has been no shortage of chatter about what we have seen so far. Mike, talk to me about your thoughts on the NBA Finals. Well, Keisha, I'll go back in time. So we'll start with Game 2. I thought it was all just about the Steph Curry show. He was fantastic. We've been waiting for a performance like that from him. He was just sensational. This was an opportunity for the Cavaliers to bounce back, and Steph Steph Curry made sure that that was not going to happen. Nice job by the Warriors now to get this 2-0 lead. Then, of course, we go to this crazy Game 1 where let's start with LeBron James. I mean, this was one of the most sensational performances that we ever saw in an NBA Finals matchup. He carried his team throughout the whole game. He was hitting shots from the outside, playing great defense, penetrating, carrying his team, and all of that seems like it was for nothing the way that everything played out. Obviously with J.R. Smith, with this complete horrible bonehead play that he made at the end of the game, and one thing with J.R. Smith was that in a lot of ways he was kind of bailed out by this horrible, horrible officiating which has been continuing to happen in the NBA. Um, in these NBA Finals. The thing that gets me is it's not just the plays where the referees are missing calls, where they're getting exposed at the end of the game. It's a lot of the stuff that's happening throughout the game. Specifically, I'm talking about the three points. Three point shots that players are taking where if a defensive player just breathes on the guy, the officials are calling calling the foul. And it's just something that's starting to drive me nuts. I'll finish with this. Um, I think that the Cav- the Cavaliers have an opportunity now going home to bounce back in this series, make something out of it. But when you lose like that in game one, it just especially when you're the underdog and you're on the road and you have an opportunity to steal home court advantage, it just takes it sucks the life out of you. So I'm interested to see how LeBron and the Cavaliers could sort of bounce back now that they're in this 2-0 hole. Remember, we've seen them come down from 3-1 just two years ago and win the NBA championship, but this is a different Cavalier team, maybe not as good as that team was, and certainly with Kevin Durant now, this Warriors team is much better than they were two years ago. Yeah, so I think this finals is an extension of this the regular season for the Cavaliers where LeBron is carrying this team and is putting forth these Herculean efforts and the supporting cast really not being able to seal the deal for them. You know, we mentioned that LeBron and James had a historic performance in game one, all for naught. And, you know, I, I don't want to pile on J.R. Smith too much because I, I, I did feel a little badly for him because I actually forgot that the game was tied and I was distracted and I guess I'm not paid like he is to be aware of these type of situations, but you know, brain farts happen and we've seen it um, in over the course of basketball in the NBA and college, Chris Webber calling a timeout when he didn't have one, Magic Johnson dribbling the ball um, out of regulation when he wasn't, um, I think that, that cost him the game. So these things sometimes happen, but I think because J.R. Smith kind of has a history of these kind of boneheaded, if you want to call it, decisions and uh, that he makes during the games, I think that's added, you know, to why he was really the talk of the conversation. But my stance was, yes, he made a mistake, and it was a costly one, but there were five minutes after that that the Cavs had a chance to win. And what I saw was a lack of defense. And then I saw actually LeBron James, I thought, doing too much, feeling as though that he had to do everything and taking on three, four Warriors every time he was going to the basket. And the law of averages will tell you that you're not going to win that. So I thought, you know, the Cavaliers missed an opportunity and it seems that this team does not handle adversity well at the end of the regulation game one you just see the dejection on their faces and I think also in game two the the Cavs were in it they had a chance to to make a push to for the win but I think when Golden State just got on that run they the Cavs just fell apart 
Uh, they go back to Cleveland. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if they can win two games in Cleveland. I, I just don't know. Uh, Ty Tyron Liu, coach of the C Cleveland Cavaliers, has some decisions to make whether or not he's going to start JR or bring him off the bench. I think Kyle Korver should get some more minutes. Look, throw Rodney Hood in the game. See what he can give you. And somebody, uh, I was watching one of the sports shows said uh, this morning, said that that's not a really great attitude to have. You know, you shouldn't just throw somebody in and see what they could do, that this is not the time. But I don't know when is. I mean, you, you're fighting for your basketball lives here. You want to win this championship. And if you can get a few good minutes out of Rodney Hood, why not? Yeah. Why not try it? So um, I'm hoping that um, the Cavs can, can make it an interesting series and avoid a sweep. But it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough. And then, of course, after, you know, even in the midst of the finals, that we're still talking about what LeBron's next moves are. And looking at his face yeah. <laughs> on the bench and on the court sometimes, I just don't see how he could stay in Cleveland, but it might be by default. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so we're going to hop on 95 and go down south to Philly, and there's some... There's a storm brewing down there. The Philadelphia 76ers manager, management is having an investigation on Twitter burner accounts allegedly belonging to general manager Brian Colangelo. These Twitter accounts were used to excoriate his fellow colleagues as well as players on his own team. Mike, do you think Colangelo should be fired? Should he resign? And if neither one of those things happen, how do you think Colangelo will survive the scandal? Well... Couldn't happen at a worse time, right? The NBA draft just around the corner, and this, of course, probably one of the most important off-seasons for the Philadelphia 76ers, who have started to get some success rolling. Of course, a playoff uh, appearance just this past season. Actually, they had a playoff win against the Miami Heat. So things are starting to go in the right direction for the Philadelphia 76ers. Uh, I think they've got to move on from this guy. I think that when you have LeBron James, who's going to be one of the most coveted free agents, and people have been talking for months now about the possibility of the Sixers making a push for LeBron, when he's going out and making comments about Brian Colangelo and, and you know, um, in a negative way, I think that that's something that people need to take notice of. At the moment, I mean, from what I've heard, the Philadelphia 76ers are putting on an investigation to see how all of this played out. And I've also heard that it wasn't necessarily Brian Colangelo. Maybe it was his wife who was pushing out some of these tweets. At the same time, this is going to fall hard on Brian Colangelo. Now, to answer the last question, Keisha, uh, as far as if the Sixers do wind up keeping Colangelo and, uh, you know, how is he going to work through this? He's got to be honest. He's got to be honest, most importantly, with the players, with the fans, and, of course, with the organization as a whole, you know, specifically with the rest of the front office. I mean, he's made a mistake here. Like I said, whether it was his wife, whether it was him, of course, he must have known about what was going on. I think, though, uh, the last thing I'll say, when it comes down to, down to it, I think they've got to make a, a, you know, a decision to move in a different direction. This is something where... You know, when you're talking about guys' health issues and their injuries and specific secrets that people that, that, that shouldn't necessarily be thrown out to the public, uh, you're playing with fire. So I think that if I were the Philadelphia 76ers, I know that the draft is around the corner. I know that they only have a short time to make a decision and then make the next decision to see who they will replace them with. But I think you have to do it. Yeah. I think the stench of this situation is too great to keep Coangelo on the staff. He's got to go, whether he is fired or he is forced to resign you, as you mentioned the draft is a couple weeks away and you know the rookies that are being going to be drafted they don't have a say so in where they're going but you don't want to start off a relationship where there's already distrust you have a general manager talking in a disparaging manner about his players and releasing medical information that's a HIPAA violation when you go to the doctors you sign a, a paperwork that says that your medical information cannot be released and, and I think if it can be released there's certain guidelines that it has to that need to be met in order for your doctor to release any medical information but there's no way that in that paperwork gives the doctors or anybody permission to tweet your medical records uh, to the to public um, and then free agency you know, this is a really crucial time for the 76ers. They were one breath away from making it to the conference finals after being in the cellar for several seasons. And you have a chance 
to get a superstar name like a LeBron James, Paul George will be on the market, Kawhi Leonard will be on the market. You have free agents on their, own, on their team like J.J. Redick who was instrumental in their successes. What, what's going to become of him? Does he want to stay after this? You know, there's a lot of things, and this is just such a blow. I, you can, I don't think you can recover. And if it's the wife, well, you know what? She knew things that only he would know, so by he's still guilty by association. And so I, I think that it, he has once again exhibited poor decision-making skills because he's already under fire for some of the personnel decisions that he made. I mean, he allowed Danny Ainge to outfox him by grabbing, uh, Danny Ainge was able to get a draft pick for a, by letting the organization believe that he wanted Markel Fultz when he wanted Jason Tatum all along, sitting at the number three spot. He got him and he got a draft pick so that, um, Seventy Sixers can move up, so it's it's done. He's got to go, and I'm just wondering if this is a whole smokescreen. If this evil genius Chris Jenner is behind it, but stay tuned to find out why I might think that. And now it's time for some quick bites. As we previously reported, wide receiver Julio Jones will not report to Atlanta Falcons voluntary OTAs, but football is not far removed from his life. While the Falcons figure out what to do with Jones' contract, Jones was kicking it with Carolina Panthers quarterback Cam Newton during Newton's kickball charity event. I wonder what those conversations was between quarterback and wide receiver. <laughs> Austin Milwaukee Bucks head coach Jason Kidd is on the job hunt and he landed an interview with the Detroit Pistons to discuss filling their vacant head coach position. Jason Kidd can also count Dwayne Casey as a competitor for the job because Casey also scored an interview with the Pistons. Kevin Durant and Jeff Green are the last two active NBA players who are on a Seattle Supersonics roster and they face each other in this year's NBA Finals. According to the Seattle Times, the Golden State Warriors will host a preseason game in Seattle so that fans in the area will have another opportunity to see Kevin Durant play live. We have some news from the French Open. Serena Williams withdraws from competition due to a pectoral muscle injury. And the NBC sports program in Boston, Mike, had a sentiment talking about the quote-unquote most useless Cleveland Cavaliers. Quick question, do you, who do you think is the most useless member of the Cleveland Cavaliers? Uh, we could say Kendrick per Perkins because he's completely useless by sitting on the bench <laughs> the whole time. But, you know, I'm going to go with... Uh, Tristan Thompson, he's a guy for me who has not really been productive the first couple of games. And this is a guy that, if they're going to get back into this series, he's going to have to step up, get more physical, get some rebounds, get involved on the defensive end for the Cavs so they can hopefully turn things around. I don't want to call anybody useless. That seems a little <laughs> harsh. So I will say the most underwhelming performer for me on the Cavs is J.R. Smith. I don't think he has played up to his big contract extension nor being a starter. And my runner-up was Tristan Thompson. Um, he also got a big contract and he has pretty much disappeared for most of this season. He's had flashes yeah. um, where... You, you remember that he's on the team, but man, that Kardashian curse is real, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to What's the 401 Sports. Mike, we're about a month away from the beginning of NBA free agency, and rumor has it that the Los Angeles Lakers are looking to make a deal for the right offer. Mike, I'm going to ask you to put on your GM hat and tell me, if you were the GM of the Lakers, what would your trade offer or your trade package look like? Well, I think one thing that they could look, then they would never do this. One one thing that they could do is look to shop Lonzo Ball. I mean, he just had he had a very good rookie season, and but just the way that his father is talking about the front office and the head coach, uh, that's something that they could look into. Obviously, the Minnesota Timberwolves could possibly be looking to shop Carl Anthony Towns. So maybe if the Lakers look to shop some of their younger players, uh, so that they could try to maybe lure some of these free agents that we've been talking about for a long time. Uh, maybe that could be possible as well. We all know that the Lakers are keeping their options open, right, with LeBron James, Paul George, and, of course, Kawhi Leonard as well. I think that they're in a good spot, though, despite the fact that uh, they have this young talent. They, they didn't necessarily make the playoffs as some thought that they would, specifically LeVar Ball. Um, but they've got um, they're in a good spot here because a lot of things can go their way. 
if some of these lucrative playoff uh, or these lucrative free agents don't want to sign with the Lakers in the offseason, they still have a good core of young talent that they could wind up uh, either holding on to or trying to, you know, build for the future. Well, we'll all see how it all plays out. Yeah. So if, if I'm a Lakers GM, I'm going to try to get the most for giving up the least. And so I think one of my packages would include Kyle Kuzma, Julius Randall, and a 2019 draft pick. I'm going to try my best to hang on to Brandon Ingram. I think that he has a high ceiling, and I don't want to necessarily give up. Right. But my offer has to be enough for them to pick up the phone, not only pick up the phone, but seriously give thought to what I'm proposing. So my package number two, which I want to avoid at all costs, is uh, Brandon Ingram, Kyle Kuzma, and a draft pick. Um, I don't think that uh, the Lakers will give up Lonzo Ball because the, that's their number two draft pick, and there was a lot of hype surrounding him. Um, so I don't think that they'll give him up. At Brandon Ingram, they'll give up, I think, regrudgingly if they have to, if it means they get a LeBron, a Kawhi Leonard, Paul, Paul George. Oh, Carl Anthony Towns you mentioned, that's an interesting, uh, that would be an interesting addition. I think that, you know, you... As a Lakers GM, you want to keep your option open. You don't want to necessarily fully gut your team to get some of these free agents. With LeBron, you may have to. Uh, but Paul George and Kawhi Leonard could be uh, really viable options because they are from the, the L.A. area and have expressed interest in going back to California and playing in L.A. So I think you know the Lakers have a legit shot. Well, Keisha, on to the NFL for a little bit. And former Dallas Cowboys wide receiver Des Bryant is still a free agent. He turned down an offer from the Baltimore Ravens, reportedly. It was worth about $21 million over the span of three years. Now it seems like it, uh, he may have to wait until training camp until he winds up getting an offer. Did Des make the right decision, Keisha, by holding out? Or could he wind up on the outside looking in? Well, it seems as though Des Bryant is operating in a time warp. He's hopped into a time machine and has rewound uh, the clock about four years where he was really just pulling, putting up crazy numbers. Um, but he's not that person anymore. And the fact that his availability has garnered very little interest amongst the league is a sign that he could very well... Uh, be on the outside looking in. But I think he has enough to be a late addition to a roster. Um, you know, we're still in the off season, so there's a chance that somebody will want to um, want to sign him. And God forbid if an injury happens, I can see him uh, being signed to a team. I think, you know, if I was him, I would try to make friends with Aaron Rodgers and see if he can get to Green Bay. It's awfully cold there, but Aaron Rodgers is a superstar quarterback, the one of the elites of the elites, and could make Des Bryant look better than he is. And um, he, 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 being Des Bryant, uh, expressed interest in playing for the Giants. Well, we could just put that pipe dream and stick it somewhere because the Giants already have their hands full of trying to figure out how to sign their superstar, and I say superstar, wide receiver in Odell Beckham Jr. And also, you know, how many diva wide receivers can you have on one team? <laughs> they got their hands full just personality-wise of Odell. So um, does I don't know if he's sly like a fox and is, he knows something that we don't, but um, I would think that he might want to start changing that mental a little bit and stop rejecting offers because you never know when they just won't come anymore. That's right. I mean, he made a mistake here. He should have jumped on it. Unless he has something completely opposed to playing against or playing for the Baltimore Ravens, he's not going to get a deal like that from somebody else. And he should have signed that paper immediately and gone to Baltimore. As you pointed out, I think going forward, probably what's going to wind up being the best fit for him, and I think where he will wind up, is the Green Bay Packers, despite the fact that Aaron Rodgers has even come out and kind of been opposed to bringing Des Bryant on board. Uh, Des had a little some, some opportunities here when the season ended and then when the, the Cowboys decided to let him go. Uh, and it wasn't just the 
uh, Baltimore Ravens that were in the mix who obviously went ahead and gave him offered him a contract, but also the Houston Texans, Arizona Cardinals, a couple other teams were looking into maybe possibly bringing him on. And then, of course, when, when the NFL draft came around, it started to die out a little bit. So, uh, Dez, I still think, think ha- he still has something left in the tank. I had a Freudian slip. He said <laughs> <laughs> So, I think he still has some left in the tank, but it's... The best fit for him, I, I would think, now that he's not going to wind up going to the Baltimore Ravens, is going to be with playing with a franchise quarterback with possible Hall of Fame potential or a certified Hall of Famer who we know that's going to wind up making it there. And let's just say he's going to wind up in Green Bay. It's a good fit for him. Yeah, he should have jumped on the Texans. That seemed like a really good opportunity. DeAndre Hopkins on one side. Yeah. Des Bryant on the Absolutely. other. Deshaun Watson throwing the ball. Well, don't go anywhere because coming up is our New York Sports Report. Our photo of the week goes to the NBC Sports image of the most useless Cavaliers. Welcome back to What's the 401 Sports. We are in a New York state of mind and we are going to focus on the New York football giants. Recently, Martin Luther King III visited the organization to encourage the staff and the players to become more politically active and use their influence to have others become more involved in civic engagement. The event was sponsored by RISE, a nonprofit organization founded in 2015 by Stephen M. Ross, who is the owner of the Miami Dolphins. The organization was founded to um, harness the unifying power of sports to um, improve race relations and civic engagement. Mike, you know, with this visit and uh, Stephen Ross, be, his organization being associated with the visit, what do you think about Stephen Ross's voice or lack of voice when he came to the national anthem and the protests? Well, I think that with Stephen Ross, one of the issues that you have with him is that he's been a flip-flopper. And what I mean by that is he was supporting Trump in a lot of ways, not necessarily some of what Trump was doing with this anthem, but uh, one of the things he he was uh, approved is some of the policies that Trump has instituted since he's been uh, the the president. At one point, uh, Ross said that all the Miami Dolphin players were to stand during the national anthem, and then, of course, he backpedaled on that. And there have been numerous sort of conversations comments like that where he'll say one thing and then he'll say the other. So I think that definitely hurts him. Similar to Pete Carroll, right, who went ahead and penned this essay, whether for good or bad, and whether or not people are going to buy into it or not. I will give Ross some credit here since he has started this RISE program, right? Whether or not he is fully involved in this, he has put his name to this, and he has shown at least some... um, uh, you know, he has shown that he is willing to kind of at least make some type of a difference. But at the same time, uh, as, as I pointed out before, a lot of these NFL owners, they're completely out of touch. And then with the whole Colin Kaepernick situation with some of these owners, when Colin Kaepernick started uh, kneeling, what, almost now two years ago, uh, they didn't think that this was going to be a big deal. They really didn't. If they did, they would have issued a statement. They would have done something from the get-go. But they let this fester and they let this drag on until it really became not even, you know, as you pointed out earlier in the show, Keisha, until Donald Trump kind of got in the mix and started calling the players out. So I think with with Stephen Ross here, uh, it, it's it's tough to judge. But at the same time, I think if you're going to be all in, you've got to be all in. You can't just be on the fence and say one thing and then do another. Yeah, I mean, he did flip-flop, as you mentioned, um, in regards to the protest, um, whether or not he... Felt as, I mean, he felt as though his, his words were misconstrued when he said that the, the players will stand during the, the national anthem. You know, for him, uh, what his point of view was that he felt that the protests were no longer effective because the meaning behind them was hijacked by Donald Trump in those of his ilk. So for him, he's like, well, let's find a different way. And I'm wondering, you know, as I think about the protest itself and and how I feel about them and and you know I wonder the same thing you know I protests are not and demonstrations are not meant to be comfortable they're I think in their nature they're meant to be in your face and disruptive to a certain sense but you know what happens when your message is lost is it time to change course and figure out another way uh, to demonstrate and to protest but then you know if you do that if you find another way and change course, 
Are you somehow admitting defeat? Are you backing down? So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of conflicted on it as well. Um, you know, ag again, with the owners, they're business people. They voted, some of them voted for Trump. Stephen Ross says he likes him, but not everything about him. So I, I don't know, it's hard. But you know, I do give him uh, an A for effort in terms of putting his name behind an organization whose mission is to um, to bring about social change and improve race relations. Well, Keisha, just a little bit on the New York baseball front with the two teams the Mets have been struggling as of lately. They got off to that red-hot start where they were playing terrifically and now with some injuries to the pitching rotation, uh, and it just hasn't really gone well for them. Under 500 at the moment as we get into the month of, you know, into the into middle ju of June. So it's been a little bit tough for the Mets. Meanwhile, the Yankees, you know, they have, they're at the moment 20 games over 500. They've really been playing well. And the, the big question for them is they get into the, uh, the, the mix here in the regular season is whether or not they're going to be able to go out and get a starting pitcher before uh, the trading deadline because that's something that's been holding back. But I'll say this, so far uh, it's been a lot of fun watching this team. They've got a good young talent with uh, Glaber Torres and um, of course Miguel Andujar who's been their third baseman being, being steady. And they've got a lot of stars on this team so it's going to be really fun over the next four months to see how this all shapes out for this team as they get ready for hopefully what will be a second postseason run in a row. Yeah, well, we'll stay tuned. I saw John Carlos Stanton on Jimmy Fallon. I thought it was quite funny. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we're going to go to the courts of the NBA, and we're going to talk about our borough heroes, the Brooklyn Nets. So we reported recently that the 10 members of the Brooklyn Nets teams are out in, LA, in Los Angeles bonding and practicing. However, ESPN analyst Jalen Rose did not get our memo. He did not watch the show. He said on his show, Get Up, quote, I promise you, the Nets, they play right here in Brooklyn. Those players are not exchanging texts with each other this offseason, end quote. Point guard Jeremy Lin of the Brooklyn Nets was the first player on the Nets team to respond on Twitter by saying, quote, hmm, Jalen, much respect to you, but no idea where this came from, lol. I just had the whole team over for a fat barbecue last week, end quote. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> Stay with us. We'll be right back. And now we're going to go off topic. Unless you've been living underground, you know by now that Tristan Thompson was outed cheating on his girlfriend, Khloe Kardashian, while she was pregnant with their first child. Well, Khloe's brother-in-law, Kanye West, took his thoughts to record on a new track on his album called All Mine. Earlier in the show, I said that maybe I thought that Kris Jenner was behind the Twitter scandal in Philadelphia to take our minds off of what was really happening. And that is in regards to point guard Ben Simmons. Reports state that Ben Simmons dumped his singer girlfriend, Tanache, for Chris's daughter, Kendall Jenner. Hmm, we'll see how that unfolds because I also saw a picture of Kendall allegedly kissing someone who was not Ben Simmons. Well, on that note, we have to say goodbye to you guys. We don't want to, but don't worry. You can keep up with us until we meet again next week by following us on Instagram and Twitter, liking us on Facebook, and subscribing to our YouTube channel, All at 411 Sports TV. Be sure to download our podcast on Google Play Music, Spotify, and Stitcher. I'm Keisha Wilson, and on behalf of Mike McDonald, we'd like to thank you for joining us this week, and we look forward to checking you out again.